All right, guys, here's another episode of the Daily CDs. I'd like to take this time to thank all the people who've joined my Patreon. I really appreciate that. And then also the guys who have joined the, my membership on my YouTube channel. Uh, all that really helps a lot. And also to uh, Value Pack, dog food. You know, I fed Value Pack before. I really thought it was good dog food. The hounds did really good on it. And uh, I'll be feeding it again here soon. Uh, I think it's really important that we support the companies that support what we do. Also to W Supply. Uh, they provide this platform for us to share our content. And uh, I want to thank them for that. Anyway, here's that episode. Enjoy. Okay, this is about a fellow sportsman in, from New York City that had a bunch of... Uh, Department uh, apartment buildings there that brought him in a big income, and he done lots of hunting. When he hunted all over the world, and if you look in some of these big hunting books, well, you'll find his name, Fred Hollander. And uh, he was raised in this country, of course. That's he was of German descent, and he still had kind of a brogue to his talk. But anyway, he lined up for this line hunt. Now, this was just before World War II. And we now had a camp in the Brown Canyon on the west side of the Warchuca Mountains. On the east side, I beg your pardon. That was on the east side of the Warchuca Mountains. And I knew that he was going to be there the next day. So I decided that morning I'd make a circle and see if I could find any, any line sign. I knew there were some lines in those mountains. But I took a pack of hounds with me. I took five hounds. <clears throat> and I got over into what's called uh, Garden Canyon. Now, that's on that Fort Wachuca military reservation. But I had a permit from the commanding officer there to hunt on that reservation, to hunt lines on it. So I went over and then I went up another little prong, that pretty good sized canyon that run into that Garden Canyon. Now that would make me be probably five or six miles from this camp. And there was a cabin there that was camped in and had dogs tied all around and had their little houses there. And I hit this fresh line track. Well, I decided I'd let them go. So it was fresh, and they probably had this line treed within an hour. So I went to them, and I saw that it was a good big female line. Well, I pretty well knew what it was from its tracks. So I stayed there with them and let them bark for a while. And this line was a pretty wild line, and it didn't want to stay in that tree anyway. So I jumped it out. And it made quite a little run, and they treated again. Well, now, I didn't go to them that time. Because when you go to a hound and go right up to them, and they know you're there, and then you right turn around and ride off and leave them, they don't understand that. They, they don't know why that you left them, and that'll make them leave a tree lots faster than it will, if you'll just let them go and not go to them. So I didn't go to them. I just beat it back to camp. And I got back to camp, and I knew that Ernest and Vincent and this hunter was going to be there that, that night. But they wasn't going to be there till after dark. So I wrote them a note, and I said, I'm a riding old Budweiser. That was one of my mules, and he was a going son of a gun. I said, I, I, I have a lime tree in McClure Canyon. So you come into McClure Canyon, and I'll be up McClure Canyon somewhere with a lime. And if you don't find me, you pick up old Budweiser's tracks and trail him up. And where you find old Budweiser, well, I'll be around there somewhere with a line treed because I'm going to keep that line treed until y'all get there in the morning. So I turned to lose two or three more dogs and 
Away I went. These was young dogs that I took that time. And got back up there and got back up to that tree. Now, the youngest, most inexperienced dog that I had amongst them five it had left that tree. And I met it a trailing milk. No, oh, it wasn't over a half a mile from the tree. So I got air cream and we went on back to the line. And just as I got up to that line, well, it bailed out. And they run it all around there. Well, now there was, the bluffs weren't high, but it was just kind of little rims. And this thing wouldn't leave those rims very far. If it did, it'd, it'd double back and go back into there. And it would tree. Well, then, but all that time, it was getting late in the evening. And it finally jumped out again and treed in a big old juniper, which would be a fine place to keep it all night. And a lot of wood right there, so I got down and, and drugged me up a bunch of wood and got all ready to stay all night and got me a fire going. And uh, well, I hadn't been around that far but about an hour till it bailed out and the race was on. Well, I had to kick out my fire and then go after them. And that time, it is treed about in the worst tree that it could get in. Now, that made, let's see, one, two, three, four trees, I guess, had already been in that day. And I looked at it, and this was a good-sized pinyon tree, probably a foot through it, and went up maybe 40, 50 feet. And it was up in there on some limbs and looked like it was comfortable. And this tree sat right on the top of a little bluff that was about 10 feet high and then just went right into the bottom of the canyon. And the, it was real steep there. And I looked out all over and I said, well, it'll stay here tonight. And I'll bet it stays up there all night because this is the worst tree it could get in for me. But it wasn't very far from the trail that they'd be coming up the next morning. So I had to take and the best I could dig out a place in the hillside to build a fire because I had to have a fire because it was cold. Then I, I dug out a place for me to sit down in and it was all wet. Then the ground was real moist. So I managed to get a little wood and I had a good light with me, and I tied old Budweiser and fixed everything and got as much wood as I could and built me a little fire, and I couldn't build too big a fire because it'd roll off into the canyon, and uh, boy, what I mean, I spent a miserable night. I'd sit down, then I'd get up and turn around that little old fire, and then I'd build it back up, and I didn't get any sleep at all because I was moving around nearly all night. And sure enough, it stayed in that tree. Well, about nine o'clock the next morning, well, I heard them a coming way down there. And uh, they had brought two or three dogs. And here these these dogs of theirs heard the ones I had a barking, and here they come. And of course, I knew that they weren't too far then. And, uh, and I heard them away down there. And it stayed in the tree until they got up right close and then it bailed out, run around there and treed again. And we got up there and he was quite a photographer and he took a bunch of pictures. And he said, well, let's jump it out again. And so we jumped it out again and every time it'd run a little, little shorter race. And they treated it again. He got up there and took a whole bunch of pictures and he said, well, let's jump it out. I said, now listen, Mr. Hollander, I said, that line has jumped out of a whole bunch of trees. And I said, uh, if this bunch of dogs catches that line on the ground, there's 11 dogs here with the ones you brought. So I'd, let's see, I'd brought five. And then when I come back, I brought three. That made eight. And they had brought three. So that made 11. And I said, that line wouldn't have a ghost of a show with all these dogs because they'd kill it. He said, well, he said, uh, you've explained everything to me and told me the changes that I'm a-taking. And he said, 
I will be pleased if they catch it and kill it. You won't hear me make one complaint because I know what to expect. But I'd like to see if they can put it up another tree so I can get some more pictures. I said, okay, you understand everything? He said, well, yes, I do. I said, all right, we'll jump it out. Well, when that line come down, not too high up that tree to jump out, it jumped out and it was, and I was right there and watching it. And there was some brush there. And as it put its front feet out to, to hit, well, its front feet kind of hit a bush. And his chin kind of went down and hit on a rock. Well, it jumped right up off that mountain. It went. And all these dogs were loose. Of course, there's a building right at it. And I took out after them, and they run down on this hillside going towards this canyon about 200 yards. And those dogs just caught that thing right on the ground. Well, by the time I got to it, got to them, they had it practically dead. Well, I couldn't get them off of it, so I just left them alone. And in a little bit, well, they polished it off, and they had it dead. So I said, well, you fellas, come on down here, and let's get this thing. And I said, it's dead. And he didn't say a word. He said, well, he said, the reason I didn't shoot that thing, it's my own fault, and I'm perfectly satisfied. My, my hunt's over. And he just went on back to camp then, and they took him back to Tucson, and he caught a train back home, and then he wrote a story about that hunt. He said, my line treed before I got off the train. That's what, that was his uh, title to his story. Well, now this hunt took place in the swamps of Nayarit, and uh, right down close to that big lake that I've told about before, they're called Iowa Bravo. That means bad water. And uh, that bad water meant that there would be, when the wind is blowing, that lake is big enough that it have good waves in it. But anyway, we went down and made a little fly camp away from our main camp. And the fellows that we had a hunting was from California. And one of them was a, a bow hunter. And you know, I should remember those fellows' names real well, but that's been quite a few years ago, and I just can't remember their names. Well, one of them, quite a few years before this happened, had got hurt badly in an automobile wreck, and his uh, back was bad. And he was trying to walk through those swamps, and he kept a hurting his back. So he had his partner do the hunting, and he is hunting with a bow and arrow, wanting to kill a jaguar with a bow. Well, we treed one jaguar, and he put several arrows through it, and it bailed out, and there's a fight in the dogs, and right on the ground. And uh, Sammy Foster, boy, there's a working for me to keep it from killing any of those dogs while well, he killed it with a rifle. Well, then after that, well, we was down on this edge of this Iowa Bravo. Now, that that night when we were calling, we were had went from the little fly camp from across that Iowa Bravo into an, another area and was going to only make that one night's hunt day's hunt there and call that night and come back and pick up our fly camp and go back to our main camp. So in our calling that night, we got two jaguars to answer him. And we called them, and we knew one was coming from one direction and one the other, and we called them together. And one was a, a big female, and one of them was a big male. Well, the next morning we went out there, and we... And our striped dog, Little Brownie, picked up this tracks of this female, and away he went, and we turned them all loose, and boy, the race is on. And we were trying to follow them, and Sammy Foster and old Phyllis is up a ways from us, and now in a minute here, and another Mexican is with them, and now in a minute here he come, a running, 
and he said they just saw a big jaguar swim a stringer of water right up there. They just seen him. And they said for me to tell you to get those dogs and get up there. Well, here come them, the pack of dogs, and they was uh, really uh, coming right straight towards us. And I r probably run for 50 yards, maybe 75, to get in front of them to see if I could get them off, take them up to where they seen that one. And just before they got to where I was, well, they went to baying right on the ground. And they had the, they had the female jaguar bayed right there. Well, it, they bayed along a little ways, and then it come a tree. So we got there, and this old boy put a whole several arrows in it, and it stayed up there. But it wasn't dead. And finally it started out of the tree, and I told him, I said, I can't afford to let that thing come out of that tree alive amongst these dogs. Now, are you going to, do you want to shoot it with this rifle or me? Because it'll, I know that it'll die from those arrows, but no telling how long it'll take. He said, well, if it's got to be killed with a gun, let me kill it. So he killed it, and I, I told that Mexican, I said, run back up there and get old Phyllis and, and Sammy and come on back because we got all the Jaguars we want. We don't want to go up there and run that other one. And uh, so they went up and told them, so come back and we put the, we had both boats there, so we put the Jaguar and the dogs in one boat and we got in one and the way we went back across Iowa Bravo and we stopped at camp and had something to eat and then we loaded everything and we started pulling out towards our main camp and we were just right in the edge of this Iowa Brava and where it went into a big stringer of water there where there wouldn't be much rough water. And now this is long in the afternoon and the wind had come up and there was some waves there. Well, we had this uh, Curtis Jones. He was down there and he was kind of crippled and had the, the kind of the multiple sclerosis and would drag one leg along, but he was a good mechanic, and that's all he was there for, was to keep those outboards motors running, and we had, I think, four outboard motors. So we put the dogs, I believe that we had 14 in this boat, and we had them tied around the edges of it, so they wouldn't all shift their weight all at one time, or to the back, or to the front, and turn that maybe turn that boat over. So we were coming in behind them, and they wasn't 150 yards from going into this still water when they hit a pretty good wave, and a bunch of water come over the sides into that boat, and instead of this old boy a cutting that motor and letting that boat settle down, it had held the weight all right, because those little old boats had hauled lots of weight. Well, he just gunned it for all it is worth, and you know that boat, the, when the front end of it rose, all the water run right back to the back end, and he just kept a-gunning it, and that thing just turned right over backwards, right in the water. And we were up a ways beyond, but well, here we come, and old Sammy Foster was uh, driving that, running the motor on this other boat. And as we come by that boat, I dived out, and he just jumped up and left that thing a running. And he dived out too. And there's one Mexican boy run back then and cut off the motor and got the boat back up there close to this, and it has turned over. And old Sammy and Phyllis went to driving under that boat, and the cutting dogs are loose. And they cut several loose, and when they did, they'd be their senior drowned. That I'd take and, and take them over and get them in that other boat. And we got out several dogs. Well, I guess we got six out, and eight was drowned right there. And what I mean, there was a pack of Jaguar dogs there that were an honest to goodness real pack of Jaguar dogs, and they had caught lots of Jaguars. And I was a long time of building back up before I built up that good a pack. And so 
And we went on to camp with what we had left. <clears throat> and that old cook up there that had one dog in the bunch, well, let's see, we had Rounder. Now, he was a bobtail small hound, 50-pound hound, and he was half blue tick and half walker. Then I had a good-sized, rangy-built female that was just in her prime. Now, Rounder was a slowing up, but this Lily wasn't, and I think Lily was the best dog there. <clears throat> and she was a, a fairly tall, rangy-built, real muscled-up female, and you would say she was a spotted and had ticks on her, you'd say she was of the English color. And then I had two small hounds there that I called, and they were solid red out of, out of music, which was a real smart hound, but they were mean. They were mean to either people or animals. And when they got to a jaguar, they always made him stop or they got hurt. And they were hurt, hurt a lot of times that season. Uh, I called them dude and dandy. So that would make four. Then I had a big blue tick that was a, a good hound, and I called him Bing. Then I had a black and tan that I called Sport. And let's see, that would make six. Now, well, I had seven in that, in that deal, and I can't write off call the name of the other one, and I don't remember the name of the one that that old cook had. But when we got back up there and told that old cook about it, well, I think it hurt him as bad uh, losing that one. He wasn't any good anyway, but I didn't want to tell him just really how sorry he was because it would have hurt him too bad. And I believe it hurt him just as bad about losing that one, you'd say, about worthless dog as it did me to losing that whole bunch. <clears throat> but we got out three out of there that were that, that were good hounds, but both of them was old. And let's see, out of 14, there was six. And then this Mexican, he had a couple of little old hounds there that was saved out of the bunch, and they weren't any good either. Anyway, we saved six, and that was a pretty sad procession when we come back into that main ranch. And we, the Jaguar was in that boat with them, and we didn't lose the Jaguar. It lodged under a seat, and it never did fall into the water. We got the boat righted back up, and the Jaguar was still under the seat. But we'd lost a bunch of stuff out of the boat. So the next morning, we went back down there and pretty well spotted the place, and old Phyllis, then he, Phyllis is a man older than I was. And another boy there that was raised right there, working for us, and they died down and on the floor of that lake, and they were diving from 12 to 15 feet of water, and they'd go to the bottom, and they retrieved a lot of that stuff that we'd lost out of the boat and got most everything. And they even brought up a six-shooter that was laying down there that we'd lost out of that boat. And so then we come on back, and that was supposed to be the last day of the, of the hunt of that season. And it was, and it's a good thing it was because we were really short on Jaguar dogs then. And that was, a, that, that hunt come out all right for game because we'd gotten two jaguars, but it didn't come out very good for hounds. Well, old Sammy Foster and I both tried diving out and going down like them other boys did. Well, we could manage to get to the bottom, but we wouldn't have enough wind then left to look very much till we'd have to turn around and come back out. So we didn't do very good on the diving, because those Mexican boys could really skin us when it comes to that. Well, this is about a, a, a guaranteed jaguar hunt. Now, we don't guarantee hunts because no telling anything can happen. And uh, we usually got what we went after, 
but we didn't always get what we went after. And you couldn't afford to guarantee hunts and then not get anything and not get paid anything for it because we was having a hard time making a go of it anyway. But anyway, this fellow was named John McKeel, and he was from Essex Fells, New Jersey. And he had been down there the season before and went up over into New Mexico with uh, Bill Lee. And Bill Lee was one of had done by far less hunting than any of the Lee boys with hounds. But Bill took him over there anyway, and, and they, I think, more or less accidentally caught a line. But anyway, then he wrote, and he wanted to come back on a jaguar hunt. But he didn't say anything about going to have to have a guarantee. And so when he came back the next year, he was on his honeymoon. He had come down to Florida and got married and then drove out there in an old Model A Ford, he and his wife, and landed there at Paradise and wanted to go jaguar hunting. But he wanted a guaranteed jaguar. And I wasn't there when it when the guarantee was made, because if I had it been, there'd have been a big ruckus. But this older brother Ernest, he just figured that Clay and I could do most anything, and so all right, he had he guaranteed him a jaguar. Now I'd been out on a lion hunt somewhere, and came in, and Ernest told me, says, "Well, says uh." John McKeel, we all called him Mac, says he wants to go on a jaguar hunt and says, I guaranteed, guaranteed him a jaguar. Well, now, we hadn't done a powerful lot of a jaguar hunting up to that time. And we had never had been way south in Denia Reet and down in there. Sonora had been the only place that we had jaguar hunted. And I said, well, now, Ernest, I don't like that. I said, guaranteeing that old boy a Jaguar, and anything could happen. And if we don't get him a Jaguar, we don't get any pay. And if we did fail to get him a Jaguar, we would be out a doggone good bunch of money because it's going to take quite a little to get down there and expenses and all that and make this hunt. Oh, he said, I think you boys can do it all right. I said, yeah. I said, uh, you can guarantee it, but we're the ones that have to do it. Well, he said, I've already done it. I've already guaranteed him a jaguar hunt and told him you'd take him. And so we took old John Bendel, his old, his father, Ernest's father-in-law, which is a man then up in years, is the camp cook. And he was a pretty good camp cook. And uh, so Benson went with me then to help on the hunt. So we loaded up, <clears throat> we went to Douglas and crossed it our Prieta, and it took I think about a day and a half over those roads to get down to where we was going to hire a pack outfit and go over to that <clears throat> where the that real Vavispe and the real Iris runs together. Well now that Vavispe on the upper end of it is called Bavispe, and then as you get farther down on it, the same river, they call it Rio Granado. So that was really the Rio Granado, and it and the Rio Iris run together, and they were smaller rivers, and of course they were bigger when they run together then, and they formed the Rio Yaqui, which is a pretty good river, and it's the main river of Sonora, Mexico, and it all of the headwaters of it is from up in the United States, and we was about 150 miles south of the headwaters, maybe a little farther. But anyway, well, we had been down there before and in that area, and that's where we hit that dry weather and hard going, and it and uh, had. In the last two days, it caught two jaguars and two big lions. So we hired us a, a whole outfit and some Mexicans that more or less knew the country pretty good and packed over there. And I knew where we wanted to go, and 
make camp. Well, I thought there was the most jaguars that I knew of around in that area. And when we hit them rivers, they were so big we couldn't cross them. So we had to camp on the side of the river that we were on, which would be on the east side. West, west no, be on the west side. And so, all right, we made this camp up in a little side canyon there right off the river, which was a nice little camp, running little running stream and and a lot of feed for mules. We had all mules except this one old mare that we took and we called her the bell mare. Now you could take those mules and put that bell on that old mare and hobble her up in good feed and you could bet your life that every one of them mules would stay around that old bell mare and go up and, and get her and take her hobbled off and lead her into camp and every mule would follow her right into camp. And that's the way we kept track of our saddle animals because we couldn't keep them tied all the time and ride them because that was hard gold. And we took in a, a little grain for them, which not too much, but we'd feed them a little grain along. So, all right. I thought it all over, and I said, Now, listen, boys, we can't get to where we want, I wanted to go. So we're going to start here, and we're going to take a pack mule with us, and we're going to take two Mexicans, and Vincent and I, and McKeel. That'll be five of us. And we're going to leave here at daylight in the morning, and we're going to lay down under that tarp on a blanket, and we're going to stay out two nights and make big circles till we find the jaguar and know where we want to hunt. And stay in camp one. Well, now, see, I don't think we'd have had so much trouble of finding some jaguar sign if we could cr cross those rivers. Or that one after the other two run together. But they were all a flooding, so we just couldn't take the chance. Because it was liable to lose some of our pack animals and a lot of our equipment and supplies and things, and we just couldn't afford to do, to take the chances, because that river, bo all, both of them was a rolling. And uh, so we had to make our camp on that west side of the river. That was just compulsory, not that we wanted to, and that's the reason we had to make these big circles to find where we wanted to hunt. Well, then uh, <clears throat> we'd... Spent that night in camp, so early the next morning while we at daylight while we pulled out again, we'd got a little extra supplies and we'd got some fresh mules and fresh dogs. Now, on those huge circles like that, you really do knock your dogs out because you travel for miles and miles. Well, we made another two-day circle and laid out far off. Two nights, that'd be three days all together. And late the ne that evening we come in, well, that, on that circle, we had found the tracks of a big male jaguar. But it was several days old, and we never could find where he'd went, or just that one place is all we found his tracks. Of course, the dogs could, couldn't smell him one night one bit, and they never did even act like they ever got a little wheel. And so we stayed in camp that night. Early the next morning, we was up to go again, and we got up, and I woke this John McKeel up. And I said, say, Mac, I said, get up now, because the mules are saddled. We've all eaten breakfast, and we've got your breakfast cooked, and just as soon as you eat, we're riding out of here. And he didn't get up. So I went back. To, we had him a tent made. And we were sleeping under flies. Just tarp stretched up. I had him and his wife a tent made. Put up. So I woke him again. And waited a little while. And he didn't get up. So I went down there the, the third time. And I said, now listen, McKeel. You're coming out of there. I'm going to give you five minutes. And if you're not out. 
I'm going to come in there after you. And when I come in there after you, I'm going to get you by the heels, and you're going to land down here in this little uh, stream of water. And maybe that'll wake you up and make you so you can get up. Well, he, and I meant it, and he knew that I did. So I, I, he, he come out, ate breakfast, and he's kind of little, kind of grouchy. And we hadn't rode very far till he got up pretty close to me, and he said, Dale, what's the push? I said, listen, Mac. I said, you wouldn't come down here without a guaranteed Jaguar. And Ernest guaranteed you a Jaguar. I said, I didn't guarantee you the Jaguar. Ernest did. And I said, Mac, you're going to stay with me until I get you a Jaguar. And by golly, you're going to go. And now, it's not my doings. It's your own doings. He rode a little ways farther, and he said, well, Dale, I'm going to figure on doing some more hunting with you. But I'll tell you one thing. This is the last guaranteed hunt I'll ever go with you on. So then if I am awful tired and all and want to lay in a day, I can. I said, all right, Mac, that's up to you. But this is this is the guaranteed hunt we're on now. Well, we made a, a real big circle. And the second day, well, we did hit the tracks of a female jaguar. And the dogs could smell it a little bit. And they could trail it a little bit. Now, here's how tired those dogs were. We were just traveling them to death. One of them got tangled up in some vines, and I had to go and cut him out because he is so tired he couldn't get out himself. Well, I don't think I mentioned it before. Maybe I did. Well, <clears throat> this old boy was on his honeymoon. And that might have been kind of the reason that I was having him a, a hard time getting him up. But I didn't have a hard time getting him up only just that one morning. But he, anyway, we went on back to camp then. I, I'm sure that was the third day circle. Got into camp real late that evening. And the next morning then we were going again at daylight. And we headed in the direction that that female jaguar was a traveling. Well, we probably about all real pretty late in the real late in the evening. While well, we was up kind of at the head of a pretty good sized canyon that had a good running stream in it, and we spread out our tarp and got under it and took. See, we always carried a little bit for us to eat and the dogs and the mules, and we would stake our mules out on those trips at night to the best grass we could find so they could get something to eat. And those were small mules, but let me tell you, when they are raised up in Mexico, they're raised to be tough and rugged. If they don't, they just don't live. So the next morning then, we made this went way down this canyon and we hadn't went so very far until we found where this female jaguar had crossed but they couldn't the dogs couldn't smell it so we went on down right on down that creek and i imagine a mile farther well we found where she had crossed back from that side back to the other side and it was still so old the dogs couldn't smell it so I imagine then we went on down not over a half a mile and uh, found where she had crossed back over to, to the other side again. And the dogs could just faintly smell her tracks. They couldn't trade her, but they could smell it good enough that they, they could ball on it some. And uh, I said, boys, this is it. Let's go. They said, what are you going to do? I said, we're going back to that camp and we're going to get that camp, and we're going to come over here and make camp right on this stream. There's lots of good feed in here and good shade trees, and uh, it's a good place. It's it's a good place to camp. I said I noticed a spot back up yonder, just before we hit the tracks where she had crossed first, and I said it'll be a, a fine camp. And so we're just going to beat it back to camp which will take us until the afternoon, 
and then we're going to get everything packed up that we possibly can and going to pack everything in the morning and we're going to bring it over here, which will take about a day's pack to get back here with a pack outfit. And so I said, I'll figure out just exactly then what we're going to do after we get in here and camp. So we did. We done that. We went back to camps and got everything as much packed up as we could for the next morning. And then the next morning, it didn't take us too long to get everything together. And we got them on our pack animals. And away we come. Well, now you want to realize that we had 20 head of pack animals because we had to pack all the supplies for a long hunt in case we had to make it. So you can, there were uh, just uh, three Mexicans and uh, Benson and I that was uh, trying to get those pack animals. So it takes a while to pack that many animals and to get the packs balanced and everything to where it'll, it'll stay on a pack animal. So we went on then and went back in there to this place that I'd picked for a camp and it was a it was a pretty camp, and we got our stuff off, and we was a, getting the McKeel's tent and getting the flies and everything all fixed. And of course, we had tied our dogs right the first thing when we got there, cause we didn't want them straying off or going off and maybe go, trying to go a hunting by themselves. But they were pretty well wore down because they had covered miles and miles in the the last few days. So, as we was a milling around here, here was a kind of a funny thing that happened. Well, right in the middle of this camp, well, Benson walked up to me and he said, listen, Dale, says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I said, what did you do? He said, I'll bet you $5 that I can show you a Jaguar track within 20 steps. While well, I stood there and thought a little bit, and we had just been a million and taking stuff down and the dogs all over everything. And we'd, you know, I knew there was something a little bit fishy about that. So I said, what did, did you do? Did you find a, a Jaguar track in the cow chip? I just happened to enter my mind, which is, I guess, just an accident. And he just grinned and he said, well, I'm just wondering how you guessed that. And he had found out there a, a good Jaguar track made in a right in a cow chip when the cow chip was soft and that thing had dried up and got real hard and it was just a perfect Jaguar track. And just one little corner of it broke off. And you know, I took that thing and put it in a little box and I brought it back home. When we come back, and when and my brother put it in one of his desk drawers and would show it to people when they'd come in. And he still had that Jaguar track when he passed away. And then his wife gave it to me, and I finally, in my travels, oh, well, I lost it. I don't know what happened to it. But anyway, when we got our camp all fixed, well, I said, well, late that afternoon, I... Uh, Told one of them Mexicans, I said, saddle me a, me, my mule. They said, what are you going to do? I said, well, I got an idea. And I said, I don't want anybody with me. I'm going up here by myself. They said, well, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to figure out a circle to make. And we're going to make that circle every morning. And when that Jaguar crosses that circle, I intend to catch it. And uh that then when we come in here, we will be in here. If we don't hit anything by not later than two o'clock in the afternoon, and we won't have our mules and our, and our dogs travel to death. So I did, and I got up there and I figured the circle. And uh, so the next morning we started that circle. And all right, the dogs hit a bobcat. And before, and it was a, just a practically a jump track. And before I knew what they was doing, well, they had the bobcat treed. 
and we made went on and made the circle, and the jaguar hadn't come through. So the next morning, what? We made that same circle and didn't strike anything. And come in, and we'd be in there anywhere. Well, I think that day we got in about 1 o'clock in the afternoon. And the next morning we'd done the same thing, and we hit the fresh track of an ocelot. And the dog street it. We went on, made a circle, no jaguar track. Well, let's see, I guess that one, two, three, I guess that was the third day then we'd made this same circle. Well, the next day we made this circle, and we got after a line. And before I found the track good, and knew that it was a line and wasn't that jaguar, well, they went on and jumped the line, and we got it, a good big female line. Well, that was the fourth day. And we went on though and made her complete circle and no jaguar track. Well, the fifth day, well, we were making this same circle. And just before we finished the circle, while well, we hit the, tr the tracks of that female jaguar. And, of course, I knew that, that it was made sometime that night. <clears throat> but it was uh, getting pretty hot then. But the dogs took it pretty good, and they went on to a big mountain there that was awful, awful bluffy and rimy, and you couldn't get up on it with any saddle animals. So I jumped off of the saddle animals and took after the dogs afoot, and they got up on in these rims, and they kind of turned down to where these rims come out to a point, and dropped off at the forks of two canyons there. And they were good big bluffs. And these hounds jumped that thing up in these bluffs, and I couldn't stay up with them to really hear them good. And they went around a kind of a point and over a bluff and out of my hearing. Well, in just a little bit, though, I could hear them, and I could tell that they were, that they were bayed. And I, I knew pretty well that that thing wouldn't tree, it is go in a hole. And so I got down right close to them, and they were kind of in under a bluff on a good big bench. And I got up above them and looked down there, and I had five dogs. And there were just three barking in a hole. And I knew the noise that they were making and what was happening, because that thing was a charging out at them from that hole, charging out at these dogs. Well, when I got down close to them, I didn't go down to the hole because the, the hole wasn't big enough that the jaguar couldn't, could get back out of sight. So I didn't want to go down there and have the jaguar see me. So I went in above the hole. And I, then I saw where the other two dogs was. There was a little bluff there. It must have been 10 feet high. And these other two hounds was a barking in under that, and they couldn't get back up. So this jaguar would run them off of there, charging them. So I stepped out on a point right there, right close to where I could holler around. And I hadn't had too much of jaguar experience then. And I, that's one time right there that it learned me not to holler around and make any noise of a human voice around the Jaguar, because it's going to make them do something. So I hollered around that point to Vincent and, and, uh, and Mac and said, come on, they got it. Well, they had heard the dogs and knew they were, that they were bayed, and so they had started to them. And then they got up quite a ways, and Vincent had forgot a, a, to get a light that we had carry to go in a hole with if we had to, and he run back to the mules after this light. But Mikiel answered me that right there just a few steps around that point, and he says, I'm a-coming. Well, now in a minute, those three dogs that was up there was old uh, Peggy, a little white and red-spotted English-looking dog, and Abe, at least a 75-pound big hound, blue tick, 
and Amos, a big red dick that was out of a red dick female and Abe, and he was a red dick, and he was as big as Abe, and they were in good condition and stout and hard from a lot of work. And now and then they would say, wow, 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 and I looked around, and that jaguar had come out of that hole, and I was standing up probably, oh, I wasn't over 30 feet from it, if that far. And he just looked up at me on that rock and didn't charge those dogs. He just kind of got down, kind of crouched, and was just weaving his head from side to side in a growling and coming right from me on that rock. Well, I just turned around and looked at it because I sure didn't want to kill it because I had old McKeel right there. He was right close. And when that happened, I guess those dogs figured that that jaguar was going to catch me because old Abe went up and grabbed that jaguar by the side of the head on one side and old Amos run up and grabbed it right on the other side of the head and Peggy grabbed it by the, by the hill. And for they held it for just an instant. Now this was, as I told you, was a female jaguar that doesn't grow anything like the size of a big male. Well, it took one front claw and knocked Abe loose, and then the other one and knocked uh, Amos loose, and uh, reached back and slapped Peggy, and she turned loose. But instead of them trying to get out of the way of it then, the battle was on. And old Abe and that jaguar was right head on, and they both reached out to get a hold to one another, and the jaguar got old Abe's upper jaw in its mouth. And it come down on him, and me a standing there looking at him, and I'll tell you, the bones just popped. And old Amos then grabbed that jaguar right by the side of the head and gilled that thing a twist and broke out one of the those canine, its lower left, hand, canine touch on its bottom jaw, broke it out on that old dog's head, and when that touch broke, it would just snap like a stick, and I saw it fly out of its lip and was hanging to the edge of its lip, and I saw that, standing right there looking at him. Well, I knew that I was going to have to do something or I'd probably kill those three dogs, because our their dander was up, and they was going to battle. And uh, I turned around and said to old McKeel, I said, get down here, or I'm going to kill that thing. And he said, don't kill it, don't kill it, and he stumped his toe and fell down. And I run right down to those dogs, and I had an old octagon barrel 30-30 that had been a, a long barrel, and it had been cut off, and had used it for many years. And I just took it like a baseball bat, and I hit that thing right straight across the head, just as hard as I could hit it, and that old gun just vibrated like it was just about to fall to pieces and bounced plumb back up into hitting position again, and I just come down and hit that thing again right across the head with the barrel of that gun, and I hit it hard. Well, when I hit it that second time, that old gun bounced back again, but I knocked it off of this little bluff. It was close to the edge of it, <clears throat> and you know, now you can figure how hard a wallop that that thing took, because I know good and well that if I'd have walked up to a man and I wrapped him on the, the top of the head like I did that jaguar with that gun, I know good and well that it would have crushed his skull. But when that that thing hit at the bottom of that bluff. Now, that was a funny thing. Here these two dogs was a looking up that bluff and a barking that couldn't get up, and it hit a straddle of one of them. Well, they jumped back. Then the jaguar jumped up and the dog jumped back, and both of these hounds jumped and grabbed that thing right by the hill. And it just turned kind of turned and took one paw and it knocked them both loose at one wallop because I was standing right there looking at them. 
Well, old Abe had went over that bluff and jumped away out there, and that hillside was so steep, he must have rolled off in there for at least 50 feet and maybe farther. And it was so steep, he just barely could climb back out. Well, when I turned old Amos loose to keep him from jerking me off, well, he hit right close. And old Taggy had jumped off, but she wasn't, of course, as vicious as old Abe and Amos. And that old Amos and Abe was mad. And old, <clears throat> this Jaguar got right back against the foot of the bluff there. And old Amos was a-walking right I into its face which meant he w he's liable to not walk into another jaguar's face because that jaguar, I think, would have killed him. And I said to old McKeel, he was right by me there then, and I raised my gun. I said, you kill it or I'm a-going to. And by golly, he raised up and pulled the trigger, and he killed, of course, he killed that thing, the first shot, which he should have, which wasn't over 15 feet away from him. 20th the most. <clears throat> and all right, then we finally got down there, and Vincent got there by just a little bit after that happened then, and we pulled the Jaguar back up that small bluff with a rope, all three of us, and we got our dogs back out and got them up there and went around that point and finally carried the Jaguar to the our mules, which weren't far from there, down in there. And we loaded it on, and we went on back to camp. And by golly, I felt good because the guarantee was filled. And that made, he was a 14-day hunt or a jaguar. And that made 18 days that we had hunted. We had to hunt four days over time, but he was lucky. He got nearly all the cats of one of each in that area. Well, he did. That is all in his desire. Was a jaguar, a lion, a bobcat, and an ostrich.